and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, as you've just heard, uh, Minnesota's budget and economic outlook have changed significantly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, today's forecast shows a cautiously hopeful picture of our state's budgetary future. In the legislature, it is our responsibility to be careful stewards of taxpayer dollars. It is also up to us to make sure we don't leave anyone behind as we continue our fights against COVID-19 and to rebuild our economy. We know, as today's numbers remind us yet again, that the economic effects of the pandemic are not being felt equally, that lower wage workers, those who can afford it least, are bearing it the most. As we face the challenging in ensuring stability in revenue and spending in the upcoming budget cycle, we must keep our options open and we must be laser focused that we don't add to the burden of working Minnesotans, our frontline workers. It will take all of us working together in the upcoming legislative session to get Minnesota back on track to a bright economic future for the state, for our communities, and for our neighbors. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, this is Melissa Hartman. Uh, duh, right? Um, hello, everybody. It's been a while. I feel like I'm uh, just getting back in the policy swing of things as we uh, wrap up the election season and start to look forward to the 2021-2022 session. This is undoubtedly good news today that the budget forecast is much more positive than uh, the picture we received in May and in July but we still really have a long ways to go. If we look at the uh, budget picture for the next two years, we have a projected $1.3 billion deficit, not including inflation. So if you include inflation, you assume things cost more in the future than they do today, uh, we're looking at about a $2.6 billion deficit going forward. So we have to have tempered expectations, but we do have enough money in the short term to provide some assistance to those who need it the most. COVID-19 is not hitting everybody evenly, and some of the people who are being hit the hardest need some economic relief to get through these tough times, and we should be able to do that. So I'm looking forward to working with um, all of the caucuses in the legislature and the governor's office on hopefully getting some economic relief soon. And I'll turn it over to the majority leader. Good afternoon. Today's budget forecast does make one thing very clear. Minnesota is in a significantly stronger financial position than we thought we would be last spring. It's very good news for a lot of Minnesotans. With our state on stronger financial footing and with a light at the end of the tunnel on vaccines, we now face a choice. We can choose to support the working families who've been hit hardest by the pandemic, or we can prioritize the rich and the well-connected who benefited so much from past supports from the federal government. The relief bill that we presented last week puts working families first. The vast majority of Minnesotans support common sense steps like strengthening unemployment insurance and support for small businesses. Now the question is whether Senate Republicans will join us in that. We believe they will, and we are making good progress. But as we look out across this next budget session, the next legislative session, we need to not only provide emergency relief now, but we have to make sure that Minnesota families, Minnesota small businesses, service workers, the communities of color, the people who are hardest hit by this pandemic are first in line for recovery. This does not have to be like other crises where thousands of families fall into poverty while the rich and powerful get bailed out. Minnesota should put those who are struggling the most first. And this budget forecast shows us that we have the resources to do it. And with that, we'll uh, go to Q&A. First question was from Bill Werner, go ahead. Bill, no, nope. all right, we'll go to Peter Callahan, we'll come back to Bill. Uh, Peter's question, can you update us with as many specifics as possible on the relief talks? What is the best estimate, uh, estimate of timeline? So we have been working ever since the most recent round of restrictions were announced to come up with a package of relief for small businesses, support for workers who are unemployed, and for Minnesota's neediest families. Uh, in the House uh, with the DFL, we've worked closely with the governor and we've been negotiating pretty seriously with House Republicans and think that we could have a package in rough shape potentially as soon as the end of this week. The challenge is that we need more engagement from Senate Republicans to finalize a package for an early special session. 
We will have a special session for sure on December 14th or so to debate the governor's emergency powers once more. And when we come into session on that date, I think it would be very difficult for Senate Republicans to not join the Minnesota House in passing a relief package. All right, we'll jump back to Bill. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me all right? I'm, I'm sorry about that. I didn't unmute. Um, the, the chorus from Republicans, both House and Senate, is um, no tax increases. We've got a surplus. Um, and I think they would argue, and I know, Mr. Leader uh, Winkler, that you uh, talked about working families, but I think they would argue that also we can't have any tax increases that might affect job creators or struggling businesses in any way. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, Minnesota has a lot of people who are doing extremely well. The economic shift has focused uh, consumer spending more on durable goods and things that people are buying and away from services. So this has been a very unfair economic hit to a lot of people. So I think when we're looking at a recovery, we have to get money and resources into the hands of families who can spend it quickly and start demanding resources as we start to reopen, start demanding services as we reopen. And a, a blanket across the board anti-tax message just makes sure that people who are already doing well, people who are rich, people who are well-connected are going to be served first. That's the kind of thing that we've done in the past, and Minnesota should not do this time. And if we look at the 22-23 time frame, we are talking about a significant budget deficit of $2.6 billion. And so if Republicans come into that with the perspective that no new revenue is needed, what they're saying is people who are hardest hit by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic have to face cuts in the future. So my hairstylist, who I haven't seen nearly as much as I would have this year, who's probably uh, had a, a significant income reduction, uh, the, the grocery store workers who are working on the front line, what the Republican position is saying, it's okay to cut the services at our local schools. It's okay to see cutbacks in Minnesota care where working families pay a portion of their health care expenses. Um, I, I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think that's okay. As the majority leader has pointed out, there are people who are doing fine and whose standard of living is not adversely impacted. In fact, some people are doing better. Um, I'm sure there's some uh, folks who own uh, different stocks in retail companies that are doing very well at this point in time. And so for Republicans to take the perspective that facing a $2.6 billion deficit in the next two-year budget cycle that revenue is off the table is really irresponsible until we look at how um, cuts to get to 2.6 billion would affect everyday Minnesotans. And our friends on the Republican side of the aisle are very fond of saying that they will cut things. One, one thing they have a little trouble doing is identifying those things in state government that they would cut. They're usually pretty good at finding things that they would spend money on, but they're not so uh, good at identifying things that they would actually cut. The theory of cuts is different than the actuality of taking a service that someone currently gets in terms of educational services at their local school or healthcare services for working families and cutting that back. And so we'll see what sort of a budget they assemble in the 21 legislative session and if they're able to put their money where their mouth is on the concept of cuts. Could we also get Senator Kent to weigh in on that, if you don't mind, Senator, uh, because you've got a a little lighter lift, maybe potentially to convince. Uh, Bill, uh, Senator Kent had to drop off for a oh, uh, previously okay, scheduled meeting. So okay, we will move you. on. Uh, next question is from Theo Keith. Yeah, back to the uh, um, economic relief bill. The governor just suggested that uh, it could be anywhere from 300 million to 600 million. Um, that's kind of a big difference between those two numbers. Can you narrow it down for us? What's your target number? Well, first of all, we needed the forecast to come out today to know what kind of range we were talking about. When we started uh, this process, we put together some rough numbers that showed uh, that providing $25,000 to 14,000 businesses equals $350 million. Uh, the, the challenge that we face is not necessarily arriving at a dollar amount, it's getting the money out quickly. And it is very difficult to create a, a program and grant application uh, type system and get the money out the door in a way that would actually help businesses. Uh, I did a town hall last night with Representative Wolgamott and St. Cloud and really put the question to a lot of small business owners there, you know, is time or targeting more important? And they said timeliness is by far the most important thing. 
So uh, getting money out the door quickly, possibly using the Department of Revenue uh, to transfer directly into uh, businesses' bank accounts is uh, the way that we can do it quickly. And um, we will have to have discussions uh, over this next uh, several days after we have the forecast to come up with a specific dollar amount. Is the 300 to 600 million, which is again, a very wide gap, is, is that a fair number for what you in the House DFL are targeting? Well, I think you have to consider the context. So the unemployment insurance extension of 13 weeks uh, doesn't come out of the general fund. It comes out of the unemployment insurance trust fund. Uh, and that could be anywhere between, uh, you know, 400 to $500 million. So it depends on how you're counting the dollars. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned $25,000. That would be a substantial uh, increase for what a lot of businesses receive through past rounds. So it could make a big difference. The lion's share of those are restaurants and bars. So it really would uh, target the hospitality industry. Uh, and so the range that the governor mentioned is, uh, is you know, potentially very reasonable. But we haven't had the chance to even sit down with Senate Republicans to hear where they're coming from on dollar amounts at all. And so until they engage, it's hard for us to speculate where we will end up. There are also less obvious downstream um, uh, impacts. So for example, the, the businesses that own the commercial space that many restaurants lease. Um, so if we're able to provide some assistance to restaurants, what impact does that have on them being able to stay in business and the other people who could be affected? So the difficulty we have in crafting a package is it will be um, impossible to be precise and, and to make sure that we're directing aid to everyone who's impacted. And at the same time, we at the state level cannot do enough to hold people harmless, that we really need the federal government to step up to the plate with the kind of programs they did um, in March, the PPP type of loans, which are really substantial um, investments that allow companies to maintain their payroll over a period of weeks. And I just, but yeah, I think the speaker is exactly right. The scale of support needed for businesses and families in Minnesota is larger than what the state can provide. We are talking about emergency short-term relief to hopefully get through to the part point where things can be open safely or, and the public feels confident in going to them, which is really the key point here, or the federal government steps in. Uh, last night I was talking with the owner of Great River Bowl, a family-owned uh, bowling alley in St. Cloud. Uh, they've been at their business for 41 years, he, and the owner said they've been, their family has spent 41 years building up uh, their business to the point where it is now, and in eight months, it's virtually all gone. That is the dramatic scale of what is happening to so many uh, Minnesota small businesses and the workers who are, are there working in them, and it just is a mammoth uh, challenge that is larger than what the state government can do in the long run. So we have work to do. In the big picture, short term, the package that we're working on is something that can help these businesses get through, hopefully. Okay, next question is from Mary LaHammer. Yeah, I have kind of a follow up in this vein, but short term and long term, I want to talk about the volatility of the forecast and budget and numbers. So first short term, if the governor extends the current pause, which he's hinting he may very well do through the next holiday through the end of the year, how can we know the scale of the emergency relief for the current pause if extended? And then longer term, how confident are you budgeting in the upcoming legislative session being that the numbers in this budget forecast have already moved billions? Can you accurately budget with just a February forecast? Do you wanna go ahead, Ryan? Or Well, on the, on the scale, I mean, what we're uh, contemplating and have been from the beginning is something like a 60 day bridge and the, the theory being it would give potentially a new administration in Washington time to put together a package or the current Congress or administration to agree to something. Uh, it would come at a time when vaccines would be coming on the market and we would potentially have a better understanding of the path of the pandemic in Minnesota and the level of uh, safety to get reopened. It isn't like it's a guarantee that when we get to that 60 day period, we're ready to take off again, but it's at least allows us to get that far down the road. And with regard to the uncertainty, as we look forward, I think you know some of the some of the questions from the um, MMB presser were were really good questions, 
and and some of Commissioner Showalter's answers were really good answers. You know, he and Governor Dayton structured this reserve. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to make choices. It buys us some time where we don't have to react as quickly as other states who don't have that cushion. At the same time, in a situation where we have this volatile forecast, we're really cautioned, um, you know, and, and, I, and I hesitate to say this because I'm sure you'll bring it up later when I propose to use some of the reserves if we get there. But we are cautioned to be careful about using those reserves. This is our first pandemic that all of us have lived through and have watched an economy perform. And I think it's very difficult to say we can see this wild swing from the May and July numbers to what we're hearing in um, November. We don't know what we'll see in February. I would like to think that the vaccines will work and that we will be good at distributing them. And we'll be, you know, by the time May rolls around, we'll have substantial distribution. I'm hopeful, but um, what if that doesn't work out, right? So we have to have a budget that is structurally balanced, that's looking to the future, that can anticipate some more bumps in the road. And, and I think it's really important to realize that when we look out into the future, providing services to human beings is just as important as the numbers in the bank, right? So we don't serve the state well by uh, just making the numbers work, but substantially decreasing the amount of services that they receive from the governor, government, whether that's in education, transportation infrastructure, and health and human services. Can I quickly follow up? Does that mean you're loath to drain the reserves or use a great deal of them just in case there's more? coming? I, I am loath to drain them. I think that it is a rainy day fund and it is pouring. This is the reason that we save money. You can bet that every finance committee in the Minnesota House of Representatives will be asking every entity that they finance about their reserves. So University of Minnesota, what are your reserves? Metro Transit, what are your reserves? Um, there's a reason we have reserves in this moment in time is that reason. But since we don't know what the future brings, you know, God forbid another strain of the virus or God forbid some unforeseen complication with the vaccines, we do probably not want to get down to zero. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next question is from Ricardo Lopez. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, my question has to do with, um, with something I asked the governor earlier. I'd asked him if he would support using any of the stadium reserve funding uh, to pay for other uses, um, particular housing, uh, for those experiencing homelessness, I'm and he indicated that there might be some legislative resistance to something like that. So I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, legislative leaders about, you know, whether they think any of that uh, stadium reserve money should be used for other purposes, uh, including um, homelessness, as, as the governor is proposing. Well, it's a state account with a surplus in it, like many others. Um, there is a possibility of refinancing those bonds, but not for a year or two at significant savings to the public. So yes, there's a surplus there now, and it does look appealing to, to meet immediate needs, but we have to balance that against the possibility in the future of refinancing and saving uh, taxpayer dollars. So I know it's something that has experienced considerable resistance in the Minnesota uh, Republican-led Senate, it is um, a, a fund that has given us some pause as well in the House because we're keen to take advantage of the savings for refinancing. But like all other state funds, there are trade-offs to look, to look at when we look at that particular source of money. Great. Thank you. Uh, next one is Dave Oreck. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, just to clarify something, uh, is there actually anything in any of your guys' proposals that involves raising taxes or fees in any way? There is no proposal on the table for emergency relief that involves any kind of increase in taxes or fees. Uh, in fact, we're looking at uh, short-term uh, reductions or eliminations or extensions on regulatory fees for a lot of businesses in the hospitality industry. All right, uh, Bill Werner has another question. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, I'm wondering about um, what, is the, what are the potential sticking points as far as bringing this um, restaurant and bar assistance package 
actually to fruition? And is one of them whether, in fact, unemployment benefits ought to be extended? Because Republicans have mentioned that on several occasions. Is that going to be a problem area in terms of getting agreement on that? Uh, yeah, Bill, I would say that we are making good progress and having very positive conversations with relatively few sticking points with House Republicans. The sticking point we face is that Senate Republicans have not yet engaged with a proposal. And so uh, we are hoping that they will quickly uh, join us in, in working on this. Uh, Senate Democrats have been involved, uh, and I'm hoping in the next day or so we'll get Senate Republicans. Hopefully the forecast frees them up to come to the table with some ideas about what they would like to do. But there is, a, I think, pretty strong understanding that we need to help workers and we need to help small businesses. And today's forecast should show that we have the reserves uh, in place and the uh, forecast in place to be able to do that. So you have not had any conversations with anyone in the Senate, uh, Mr. Leader, about the unemployment uh, benefit extension portion of it? Have you got any sense from them at all? I realize they haven't weighed in with a formal package yet, but. We have had uh, some initial conversations, but nothing uh, in great depth. Um, I will say that um, there seems to be uh, some House Republican uh, belief that we need to do both things in some way or another. Okay, in the Senate, you you don't have, do you have a clear? I don't, I don't know their position on the issue. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. One significant piece that should be easy for us to talk Republicans in the House and in the Senate into doing, and we've had um, resistance that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, is a five hundred dollar uh, assistance to to needy families, where we we invest one hundred thousand dollars of state resources to access twelve million dollars from the federal government. So we put. $12 million worth of spending into Minnesota's state economy with only a $100,000 investment. It would go to Minnesota's neediest families. It would almost instantly go back into the economy and serve businesses, um, restaurants for takeout, you know, you name it. It's, it's an eco economic stimulus. So I'm hopeful we'll be able to include that in this package at this time. In, in, you know, the holiday season, it seems entirely appropriate that this is part of the package and we should uh, encounter more success with Republicans, hopefully this time of year than we've had earlier in the year. Thanks, Madam Speaker. All right, next up is Esme Murphy. Yeah, hey there. Um, and forgive me, I had to dip out a little bit, but I had a couple of questions. Um, the Majority Leader, uh, Mr. Winkler, suggested or floated uh, $20,000 for each of 14,000 businesses. I think that was last week. Maybe it was the last the week before. Is that still something that's realistic? And also, uh, there had been sort of indications that perhaps there, there would be an earlier uh, special session, but now it sounds like maybe not. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in our experience in negotiating uh, uh, agreements with Senate Republicans in the last year or so is that it takes time. We got a bonding bill done, but we got it done in uh, October. We got uh, business relief, childcare expenses, and other things done, but we got it done uh, in uh, July. We uh, sent money to local governments. Uh, we kind of got in an agreement, but the governor ended up doing that on his own. And we got a police reform and accountability ability package, accountability package passed, but that wasn't done until August uh, after George Floyd's murder. So we get things done, but it takes time. I think. The speculation about when we have a special session is really just an estimate of how long it takes to negotiate this out. If we can get it done faster and we can get it out uh, a week early, that would probably be beneficial. The question is, is it useful to have two special sessions or can we just wrap this up into one and be done? Thank you. Um, legislators, like other human beings, are good with uh, having a deadline. And uh, with the governor's 30-day uh, peacetime emergency renewal coming up on December 14th, that creates a natural deadline. That gives us this week to get an agreement in concept, next week to get the details uh, hopefully wrapped up and heard publicly and, you know, uh, a bill posted, and then action on Monday the 14th, which is actually not that long away. And I also want to point out that the approach we're taking with putting money directly out in, in lump sums to businesses based on category through the Department of Revenue allows us to move very quickly. Uh, I don't have an exact timeline, but if we passed a bill on the 14th, money would be out the door before the end of the month. And is that $20,000 to $25,000 for years, that's still ballpark? 
I mean, it's entirely scalable. So the question is, what can we get agreement on as far as a total dollar amount? And then how would we divide that out? So uh, that's where uh, we started with our math. And uh, we'll see where we get with Republicans on theirs. Thank you. Uh, Pat Lopez had a clarifying question, Madam Speaker, on the 100K for 12 million, the MFIP thing you mentioned earlier. Yeah, there's $12 million in TANF funding that we can access if we invest the, basically the state dollars are the processing to, to get the money and to get it out. Okay, and with that, I am not seeing any other uh, questions. I don't know if you have any closing comments, uh, leaders. I just have one, and that is that this pandemic affects all Minnesotans, but it affects some Minnesotans a lot more deeply than others, not just in health and lost lives, but the frontline workers who have sacrificed so much, uh, teachers and school officials, and these small businesses that have been hit so hard. We are really asking them to do public health work for all of us, and it is only fair that the rest of us pitch in some resources to help them get through this. This is absolutely essential to get this done and it is exactly why we have a budget reserve. It is why Minnesota invests in each other across the state because we believe in each other. We believe that we have to treat each other fairly. And this calls for us to take action in a, in a way that we don't, other, we don't usually see. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you everyone.